We are looking unto Jesus till we safely reach the goal. And by faith we travel on, knowing that the road we travel is to our eternal home. And someday we shall be gone. For the race that lies before us is no ordinary race. We are pressing forward to win our sacred prize. And we're moving ever forward by the power of His grace. Till someday we reach the finish line. We are looking on to Jesus, for he knows the way we take. He will be our faithful guide. And he lovingly will lead us, teaching us to walk by faith till we reach the other side. For the race that lies before us is no ordinary race. We are pressing forward to win our sacred prize. And we're moving ever forward by the power of His grace till someday we reach the finish line. Many saints have gone before us, all partakers of His grace. They have reached their home above. Resting at the feet of Jesus, they behold his blessed face, praising him for his great love. There is one thing I'll remember when I find the end is near and my race is almost done. Though I was a wretched sinner, I'll have nothing left to fear, for my Savior is God's own Son. Yes, the race that lies before us is no ordinary race. We are pressing forward to win a sacred prize. And we're moving ever forward by the power of His grace Till someday we reach the finish line Till someday at last we reach the finish line The finish line Praise the Lord for that. Again, James chapter number 5 and verse number 13. And we'll read that verse again just for uh, clarity's sake. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Uh, the definition of the word afflicted there means affected with continued or often repeated pain, either of body or mind. It means suffering grief or distress of any kind, such as sickness calamity, adversity, or persecution. Uh, it means afflicted at the loss of a child or with losses or misfortunes. It means to be troubled or harassed. And every one of us have times in our life where we have stressful times, things that we go through, challenges, uh, obstacles that we must overcome. And so I want to handle this matter or teach on this matter how to handle stress in times of distress. Number one, God's people are often afflicted by the world in which they live. In Exodus chapter 1, verse number 8 through 12, the Bible says this, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, uh, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also under our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters, and watch this next phrase, to afflict them 
with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, uh, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. So here we find a record in the Bible of God's people. And they were afflicted by the world that they lived in. You can't hardly turn on the 10 o'clock news and not get stressed over our present uh, situation in our nations. We've heard much preaching uh, and teaching and comments made about the, uh, the headlines uh, not too long ago of them uh, putting their stamp of approval on same-sex marriage as well as uh, the transgender bathroom issue. And can I tell you, if you're not careful, if you don't keep your nose in the book and you don't keep your trust in the Lord and keep your reliance and confidence on Him, you and I will develop a doom and gloom attitude. The sky is falling. The world's coming to end. Can I tell you, the world may seem like it's coming to end, but God is still on the throne. God is still in charge. And yes, I know that the devil is the prince and power of the air. And yes, he's uh, given somewhat of control and, uh, in, in this world. But can I tell you, we've read the end of the book, and guess what? We're on the winning side, and we can take it to the bank that God is, everything is okay in God's kingdom. Amen? But sometimes we as God's people are often afflicted by the world in which we live. We oftentimes work a, in a secular business, and we work alongside those that are not saved or those that claim to be saved but who live like the heathen. And can I tell you, sometimes that stresses you out. How do we handle that? We're going to deal with that tonight. Number two, not only does God's people are often afflicted by the world in which they live, but number two, God's people are sometimes afflicted by self-inflicted wounds. In Judges chapter number 16, verse 1 through 5, the Bible gives the story of Samson, and it reads, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her, and it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in, and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him. Now watch this next word, uh, phrase here that we may bind him to afflict him. And he will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. And so here he was kind of yoking up with some not so good women. And the first one was a harlot. And he got up at midnight and, and carried the gates away on his shoulders. Uh, then he uh, loved a woman by the name of Delilah. And uh, the Philistines... Uh, were there and came to her and conspired with her to be able to take Samson out. Uh, he was a thorn in their side, so to speak. And uh, he said, listen, find out where his strength lies so we may prevail against him, so we may bind him and afflict him. In Judges chapter 16, later on in the chapter, in verse 16 through 22, we see the outcome of him playing footsies with this uh, not-so-good woman. It says in verse 16, And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man." And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she called him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And notice this next phrase, she began to afflict him. 
and his strength went from him. Now, mind you, up to this point, they tried all sorts of things. They tried putting his hair in a, in a weaver's beam. They tried to uh, tie him with a uh, new rope, and they tried all sorts of things, and every time Delilah said, the Philistines be upon you. I mean, he was no uh, idiot. He was not ignorant to the fact that the Philistines were out to get him, but he thought he, he acted like it was just a game, and it was just going to be any ordinary day, and he could play with sin, and, and he was actually making a mockery out of it, and every time he was able to get out of it, and can I tell you, when you and I play around with temptation, we play around with sin, and we have that uh, apathetic, lethargic attitude towards spirituality, and we think that we could just go through the uh, motions of Christianity and uh, play around with sin and, and uh, have one foot on either side of the fence, and we think that we'll just be fine, we can just keep doing it, keep playing the game, and uh, we'll be all right. After all, nothing's happened thus far, but we find here in the verse number 20, notice it, the, in verse number 19, he says, she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him, and she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep. See, when you're playing footsies with the devil and playing footsies with temptation, can I tell you, the devil's got you to sleep. Amen. And you look like, listen, you look like you're okay and you look like you got it together. But can I tell you the facade that we put on at church when we're playing footsies with the devil uh, behind the scenes, can I tell you, will only last for a little while. And so here she is, uh, he awoke out, or here he is, he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. Now watch this, he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. Notice that, that the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. Eventually, the, you know, the Lord's got a, a line, and eventually, listen, I know, thank God, God is long-suffering. Thank God that he's patient. Thank God for his grace that he gives us more than what we deserve. Thank God for his mercy that he doesn't uh, drop the hammer on our head every time that we did something wrong. Thank God for that. But eventually, his patience will run out. Right. The Bible says that he even gave, gave Jezebel a space of time to repent. I mean, he wants everybody to be saved. He wants everybody uh, to have an opportunity to get right. But eventually, eventually, we keep going in that direction. Then guess what? We bring some unnecessary affliction in our life. I love verse number 22. It says, how be it? The hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. And we know later on the story goes that they brought him out to make sport. And he had a little servant boy. And he said, listen, place my hands on the pillars. And we know that the Bible says that he uh, killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his life. And thank God that God was able to use him again. But can I tell you, that was a self-inflicted wound. That was something that should not have happened, but he continued to hang around with the wrong crowd. That was something that should not have happened, but he kept playing with his flesh and kept playing with that besetting sin until finally it got the best of him. Now, can I tell you, God doesn't want you to go into deep sin. He wants you to keep yourself clean and pure, but... If you do, thank God that there, God gives a second chance. I love the story of Peter, how he followed afar off and we give him a bad flack, but there wasn't nobody else following that close. And he was warming his hands at the fire, but nobody else was there warming their hands. I know he was around the wrong crowd, but we give him a bad flack and we give him a bad name and give him a hard time. And we know that he denied the Lord three times. We know that. And as soon as he did that, his and the Lord's eyes locked and uh, that he realized, he remembered the words of the Lord and he went out and wept bitterly to the point that he was discouraged. He threw his hands up and, and quit on the ministry. He said, I can't believe that I betrayed the Son of God that way. And the Bible said, he even went back to fishing. He went back to a secular job. He gave up on the ministry. But can I remind you that when Jesus rose again, he, he appeared to a lot of his disciples. He said, he, he told them, he said, go tell my disciples that I go to such and such a place and Peter. Now, wait a minute. Peter was a disciple. How come he didn't just say, go tell the disciple? How come he uh, 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 keyed in on Peter because he knew Peter uh, was weeping? He knew Peter was upset. He knew Peter was distressed and discouraged over what he'd done. And he felt like that God couldn't ever forgive him and that God couldn't uh, use him. And thank God he said, and Peter... And so he went and he appeared to him. And we know the story how several, uh, many days later that God used Peter to preach on the day of Pentecost. Listen, you be careful about counting somebody out. 
Amen. You be careful about writing somebody off. It just may mean that, that yes, that's what the Bible says, uh, brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. But now we got an idea of spirituality. We got to walk around with our nose stuck up in there, and if it rained, we drown. We think spiritual. Well, I got to separate as far as I can from that dirty, rotten sinner. Guess what? If we looked into your closet and into your home, guess what? We find out you're a dirty, rotten sinner, too. Amen. Why? Because we're nothing but a bunch of saved sinners. That's all God has to work with. So you be very careful about walking around like a Pharisee and uh, walking around. You, you got the walk down. You got the talk down. You, you, listen, you carry your King James Bible and somebody blows it. You want to write them off. You want to push them over in a corner. You want to put them on a shelf. You be careful about putting somebody on a shelf that God ain't put on a shelf. You be careful about giving up on somebody God hadn't given up on. You be careful about disassociating with somebody that God hadn't disassociated with because after all, God may want to use them. Them. What you and I ought to do is, is we ought to reach down and lift them up, even if they have a self inflicted I mean, Well, I tried to tell them and they blew it anyway. Well, you might have tried to tell them and they might not have listened. How many times you didn't do what you were told? Right. Amen. How many times I ain't done what I was told, but thank God that God, in His uh, spirit of mercy, He doesn't give up on us. And thank God that He's a giver of a second and a millionth chance. Amen. Listen, listen, that's why in the book of Proverbs, this is a just man falleth seven times and riseth again. Amen. Why did he put that in there? He put that in for me. He put that in there for you. Why? Because he knows that we're going to fall. And listen, you say, what's the secret to the Christian life? Getting up one more time than you fall. <laughs> See, a lot of us think the secret of the Christian life is not falling. That's not the secret to the Christian life. There's not one person under the sound of my voice, myself included, and more so myself, that ain't going to fall before the night's over. So God put that in there for us. I thank God, 1 John 1, 9 in the Bible, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I thank God that's in there. That's in there for me. Why? Because there are going to be some times that we have self-inflicted wounds. Oh, we knew we shouldn't have done it, but we did it anyway. And we, we knew we shouldn't have done it, and we did it again. And we knew we shouldn't have done it, and we did it again. And finally, God uh, says, all right, enough is enough, and I'm going to have to bring something into your life to get your attention. And I understand that, but can I take it in our mind? Yes, God used Samson in, in his dying days. And guess what? You may be here, and you may have some self-inflicted wounds. And you may say, boy, God could never use me. Can I tell you God can use you? God wants to use you. God loves you. Listen, God, listen. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, listen, God knew what he was getting himself into. He knew what, listen, he didn't come to save the righteous. He came to save the sinner. Paul, so Paul said, listen, he said, he came to save sinners of who I am chief. Amen. He, he knew he hadn't arrived. He said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I should do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, those are the things I do. Why? Because the flesh, and listen, the Bible says flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? It's full of sin. But can I tell you, God's a forgiven God. And can I tell you, you say, well, how, how, listen, I, I got some self-inflicted wounds. I got myself in a pickle, and I don't know how to get myself out of pickle. Sometimes it takes you getting to the bottom of the barrel before you start looking up. But thank God when you look up, guess what? The Bible says that redemption draweth nigh. Amen. God hadn't given up on you. Don't you give up on nobody and don't you give up on yourself. God hadn't given up on you. And can I tell you, you might have some self-inflicted wounds. Sometimes God's people are often afflicted by the world in which they live. Number two, God's people are sometimes afflicted by self-inflicted wounds. Number three, may I say this? God God's sometimes brings affliction into our lives to get us back on track with him. He sometimes brings affliction into our lives to get us back on track with him. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 31 through 33, the Bible says, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Watch this next phrase, for he doth not afflict willingly. See, God, listen, don't have this attitude of God that God's just looking for you to mess up. No, 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 no. God's looking to help you when you do mess up. He's not, he, he's not totally naive that you're going to mess up, but he's there ready to help when you mess up. 
But watch this. He said, but though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies, for he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. So there may be sometimes when you get backslidden in your heart, you get a little bit of cold on God, you start backing off in church attendance, you start backing off in tithes and offerings, you start backing off in your giving, start backing off in your soul winning. Uh, you used to sit in, in, in the front section, now you sit in the back section. Before long, you'll be sitting in the balcony. Before long, we won't be able to find you. Can I tell you, when you get cold hard on God and backslid, sometimes God will send affliction into your life to get you back on track. Say, well, Brother Craig, why is this happening in my life? I don't know. Only you and God can answer that. It may be because it's just the world that you're living in. It may be that you've got some self-inflicted wounds and you made some bad decisions and now you're reaping the consequences. Or it may be that you're a little bit caught on God and God's trying to get in your life and, and shake you up a little bit and get you back on track with where you ought to be. Psalm chapter 119, verse, seven, uh, verse 67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. So when you find yourself going astray, getting off track, and listen, only you know. See, you may be able to sit in a pew. You may still show up for soul winning, but you and, and only you know how close you are to God. Amen. Only you know how close or how far away you are from God. Only you know if you're backslid or not. Now, you stay in that shape long enough, eventually it'll begin to show up and other people will notice you backslid. But it starts off in the heart. And you may go through the motions and have the outside down, but still be backslid, still be cold, still be uh, wandering out of the way. But before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. See, God may sometimes have to come in our lives and afflict us to get us back on track and get us back to keeping God's word the way we know we should. Psalms 119, verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. See, it's in those valley times that you learn more. Amen. Amen. Listen, if everything was just going smooth and everything was just going right, guess what? You wouldn't pray. If, it, if everything was just on top side, guess what? You, listen, uh, you, you, listen, you wouldn't do what you do. Why do, you, why do you do what you do? It's oftentimes because you're in a valley. Guess what? And that's where you learn. Can I remind you Psalms 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Then it talks about him leading beside still waters. It talks about him leading uh, through the green pastures. It talks about him preparing a table in the presence of mine enemies. Where, where did all that happen? In the valley. Not on the mountaintop. By the way, mountaintop experiences oftentimes, if you mark it down, when, listen, David had a, a, a mountaintop experience, and then the Bible says it was time for the kings to go out of battle. He didn't keep his schedule. He slept in. Next thing you know, Bathsheba happened. Why? Because he was a mountaintop, and he thought, hey, I don't have to keep my schedule. Everything's going great. I can take a day off. I can sleep in. I can, and listen, and he walked right into the devil's trap. And can I tell you, sometimes when you and I are afflicted, it's simply so that God is trying to help us to learn his statutes in that valley time. So sometimes God's people will be afflicted by the world in which they live. Sometimes God's people are afflicted by self-inflicted wounds. Sometimes we are afflicted and God brings affliction into our lives to get us back on tra uh, track with him. But number four, may I say, sometimes affliction comes by way of unforeseen circumstances circumstances out of your control. I think of the Avalar family. That wasn't something they had planned. It was affliction. Sometimes those, those unforeseen circumstances, so, uh, things come in your life that are out of your control, Di a, a bad diagnosis, a death in the family, financial dilemma, a, a sickness that you can't seem to get past. And I guess what? All of us have those things that come in our life. But can I tell you, there's some things that how, what we ought to do and how to handle stress in times of distress, I'm going to give them to you. Number one, don't get so high-minded that you think affliction will not come your way. It will come. Right. Psalms chapter 18, verse number 27, the Bible says, For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. So don't get so high-minded and proud that you think affliction will not come your way. It will come. Say, Brother Craig, I got a large bank account. I got all my needs met. Can I tell you, don't be so high-minded that you don't think affliction will come because it will come. The Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust. 
Amen. Listen, I'd rather be saved on my way to heaven going through affliction with the Holy Spirit to help me than to be lost on my way to hell with nobody to help me. When, but guess what? Both saved and law uh, are going to go through affliction. We're going to have stressful times. We're going to have circumstances that we have. Well, you know, I, everything's just going great. I got a good family. I got a, a good house. I got a good car. I, I mean, everything, I got, just got a promotion at the workplace. Yeah, there's a lot of people that were, were in the same boat you're in and then got laid off. Why? Because your trust is not in all of those things. Your trust ought to remain in the Lord. And sometimes God will bring affliction in to get, you, get your trust to be back in Him. So don't get so high-minded that you think affliction will not come. And by, by the way, don't be judgmental when you see somebody else's life going through affliction and, and you're not going through affliction. So you start judging them and say, well, they must not be right with God. Well, let's see if you preach that same sermon when you're going through the affliction. They, listen, be careful about looking down your nose at somebody and criticizing somebody until you walked a mile in their shoes. See, the thing about it is we as humans are prone to negative and we're prone, uh, prone to look at the dark side of things and we're uh, prone to... And all that is, it turns into gossip. Y'all pray for so-and-so. They're blah, 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 blah. Ain't nothing but gossip. Can I tell you, don't get so high-minded that you think affliction will not come your way. It will come. Number two, realize that God understands when you're afflicted and is only a prayer away. Psalm chapter 22, verse 24, the Bible says, For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. I love the story about uh, Thomas. I know he gets a bad flack for being doubting Thomas. He was the doubter. And uh, uh, Jesus came in and showed himself, and he's, and, but Thomas wasn't there. He didn't show up. He decided he wasn't going to go to Sunday school that day. And so Jesus uh, showed up, and he wasn't there. And he come in, the disciples were telling him, hey, Jesus showed up. I will not believe unless I see the scars in his hands and the wounds in his feet. Can I notice that Jesus didn't slap him for doubt, and he just showed up a second time when Thomas was there, and he said, reach here to your hand. Amen. Re see the, the, the wounds in my hands and my feet. Can I tell you, sometimes we're going to go through times of doubt. But guess what? Jesus don't slap us. He, listen, he doesn't criticize us. He doesn't get bad on us. He doesn't knock us over the head. Guess what? He makes sure that he continues to uh, show himself real in our life until we do believe. But can I remind you, the Bible says, blessed are those that believe and don't see than those that have to see. Amen. That's where faith comes in. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. But realize that God understands when you're afflicted and is only a prayer away. So in get, instead of getting on the telephone and talking to sister so-and-so, why don't you uh, uh, call 1-800-HEAVEN and get a hold of God? Amen. Listen, there won't be, ever be a busy signal. You can't ever call too late. And it ain't going to be push one for this, push two for that. And you, you'll be able to talk to a real person. Amen. Amen. It ain't going to be no jazzed up rock music while you wait either. Realize God understands when you're afflicted. Well, nobody knows what I'm going through. God knows. Well, I've got this temptation that I'm struggling with and, and I, I just can't ever uh, get victory. I, nobody understands. Uh, you know, I'm all by myself. The Bible says, listen, we don't have a high priest. That's not. Uh, uh, he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He said he was tempted at, at all points like as we are yet without sin. And he said this, he said, sin shall not have dominion over you. And then a few verses later, it says, let not sin have dominion over you. In other words, God says, listen, you can have the victorious Christian life and you don't have to give in to the temptation. And if you do, it's because you let it happen. But God gives you the victory. He's come that you might have life and that you have, might have it more abundantly. Now, everybody wants eternal life, but not so many people want the abundant life because it takes a little bit of work to get it. Can I tell you that God understands when you're afflicted, but he's only a prayer away. So instead of calling brother so-and-so and, and well, I got to get me a Christian counselor, got a PhD from a secular university and wouldn't know God if it flew in on a net and landed on his nose. Well, they call themselves Christian. Listen, they, they've got worldly philosophy. Guess what? You need to get in and talk with your pastor because he's got some years behind it he, under his belt. And guess what? He's going to give you a Bible. See, there's some things that only God can fix. Amen. We don't need human reasoning and we don't need some man's opinion. Listen, we just need to go to the good book and find out what God says because God not only has the answer, but he is the answer. And so realize God understands when you're afflicted. He's only a prayer away. And so uh, make a beeline. Don't make it the last resort or the second resort. 
Uh, I think of Peter, he jumped out of the boat. He still, he gets a bad flag for that too. Well, he, he got out there amongst the waves. He began to sink. Well, I don't imagine you'd even got out of the boat. I think I'd have been standing right there knocking my knees right along with you. But we gave him a bad flag because he began to sink. But the Bible says that when he got out there and he got his eyes off the Savior and got his eyes on the troublesome times, then the Bible says he began to sink. But it says immediately he cried out to the Lord, Lord, save me. And the Bible says he reached out with his hand. Why is it that we get in trouble sometimes and we get our eyes off the Lord and we get our eyes on the waves and the winds boisterous and it takes us going down for the third time? Blah, 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 one. Blah, 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 two. And we're going out for the third time and then finally we cry out to the Lord for his help. Well, I don't want nobody to uh, think bad of me because I'm going through a tough time. Guess what? Everybody knows you're going through a tough time. Jesus knows you're going through a tough time. Why not just cry out to him and get help before you're going on for the third time? Amen. Just cry out to him because God understands that you're, you have times of stress. And well, he's only a prayer. Way. Number three, turn to God in your affliction, not away from him. Psalms chapter 25, verse 16, Turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. Notice here the psalmist was talking to God and said, Lord, turn unto me. He said, Lord, have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. He turned to God, not away from him. Isn't it amazing uh, that people go through a tough time and the first thing they cut out is God. First thing they do is cut out the church when the church could be a help to them. First thing they do is quit reading their Bible when it's got the answers. First thing they do is quit praying. Why? Because uh, after all, there's no hope. There's always hope with God. Can I tell you, you ought to turn to God in your flesh. You don't turn away from Him. You get sick, guess what? Keep coming to church sick. Just don't spread it. Sit up in the balcony. Use all them little sanitizer pumps that's hanging on the walls. But still show up. Uh, listen, uh, don't cut out so when and say, well, Brother Craig, I, I'm not physically able. You, you make it to the doctor. How about taking a pocket full of tracks? Listen, it may just be, listen, if you weren't sick and you weren't in the doctor and you weren't going to the hospital, guess what? You'd never meet those people. But because you are going through that, it just may won't, listen, you'll have a good testimony and you'll be able to win somebody to Jesus. And so you take your, your situation and listen, you turn your trial into triumph. You turn your defeat into victory. You say, Brother Craig, that's easy preaching, hard living. Yeah, no, nobody ever said the Christian life was easy. But it's still right. And we ought to turn to God in our affliction. He's the one that knows what's going on, and he knows the answer, and he knows how it's all going to turn out. We ought to just keep our trust in him. Uh, Job and all that he went through, the Bible says that he did not charge God foolishly. He said, listen, I didn't have anything coming in. I ain't going to have nothing going out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We ought to have that type of attitude. We ought to turn to him in our affliction. Number four, find someone who is afflicted and use your experience with affliction to help them. Psalm chapter 82, verse number three says, Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Isaiah 58, 10, And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light arise in obscurity and thy darkness be as a noonday. James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Who have you helped lately? Who have I helped lately? See, the thing about the Christian life is, well, I joined this church because of what they can do for me. No, you ought to join the church for what you can do for the Lord. What you can do to reach out and help somebody. The Bible says pure religion. See, we all want people to think we're religious, but pure religion and undefiled before God is this, that you visit the fatherless and the widow. Who have you visited? Who have you reached out and encouraged? Who have you shook their hand and gave a smile? Who have you met a need? The Bible says if it's in the power of your hand to help, then guess what? You ought to help. Can I tell you, listen, uh, you, everybody, all God's children go through a, a rough time, but you can always find somebody else having a rougher time than you. But because we're so consumed with self and our eyes are on our own problems that we pass by people and we don't even notice them. We don't notice what they're going through. We want everybody to pray for us, but we don't want to pray for nobody else. We want everybody to visit us, but we don't want to visit. Amen. I had a gentleman come through uh, not too long ago and said, uh, I just feel neglected from the church. Well, guess what? You wouldn't feel so neglected if you showed up. 
See, the fact is, is when we get consumed with self and we start backing out of the church, we're staying away from the very place that we would be a whole lot better off if we just stuck in there while we're going through a stressful time. So find somebody who's afflicted and use your experience with affliction to help them. Number five, confess and forsake sin in your life. Psalm chapter 107, verse 17 says, Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Sometimes affliction comes because you got unconfessed sin. By the way, the Bible says if you harbor that sin in your, in your heart, the Bible says that he will not hear us. Uh, Psalms 25, verse number 18, Look upon mine affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. The psalmist said, Listen, I want to make sure that I'm thoroughly right with God. Listen, if you're going through a stressful time, the very first thing you ought to ask, Am I right with God? And then guess what? You can get right with God just by confessing those sins and asking the Lord to help you uh, not to do them again. And then after you uh, establish, Okay, now I'm right with God. And then try to learn the lesson through that stressful time that you're going through uh, by confessing and forsaking your sin uh, first. Uh, Number six, stay in God's word. Psalms 119 verse 107 says, I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. He said, I'm afflicted. He said, but I need to be quickened. I need to be made alive. I need to be inspired. I need to be motivated. The word of God can do that. And he says, O Lord, according unto thy word. Stay in God's word. Well, I don't feel like reading God's word. Read it anyway. I remember when I was uh, a fre- getting ready to uh, be a freshman in high school, and my granddaddy, it, it was, we had freshman orientation. I believe it was on a Monday night, and uh, we'd gone up to see my uh, granddaddy, and he was on his deathbed. And I, I remember uh, uh, sitting there in the little waiting room, and they, I don't know if they still do it, but they had those Gideon Bibles. And as a teenage young man, I grabbed that Gideon's Bible, and I began to read the book of Psalms, and, and God brought peace to my heart about my granddaddy fixing to go home to be with the Lord. And, and then we went on and, and went to the uh, freshman orientation and when we got out we were getting out and and uh, our friend came and he rushed us up there and he just passed away can I tell you God's word is what will bring comfort and encouragement in a time of stress and, and, and listen oftentimes we don't feel like reading it but after you read it don't you feel much better but why because uh, listen you listen you say well I'm riding on fumes you know your gas light's been coming on you've been riding around. I know I know the older you get you want to you want to get gas about around a quarter of a tank some of you a half a tank some of you three-fourths of a tank you don't listen but I ride around on the fumes amen and the gas light's coming on it and there's been a few times I ain't made it but you know what? That's how we are spiritually, amen? The signs are there. We're riding around on fume. We're just barely making. All the warning lights are there, uh, but we're pushing, and we're pushing. Can, can I tell you, we ought not push. We ought to get into the filling station called the Word of God and get filled up again. So we ought to stay in God's Word. Number seven, how to handle stress in times of distress. Number seven, keep a right spirit or attitude. Proverbs 15, 15 says, All the days of the afflicted are evil. But he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. You know how to keep going and how to handle stress in times of distress is keep your spirit right. The Bible says keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. So when you're going through some issues, then guess what? You ought to walk guard around your heart and you ought to make sure that your spirit is right. Don't point out the negative. Don't dwell on the negative. The Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Amen. He is a great physician. And can I tell you, some folks that go through the same trials that you're going through, guess what? If they have a right spirit, sometimes they fare better than the person that does not have a right spirit. So you keep your spirit right. Number eight, keep yourself clean. Folks need you at your best. Keep yourself clean. Folks need you at your best. Proverbs 31, verse 4 through 5. says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. See, you and I as leaders, guess what? we got to keep ourselves clean. Oh, there's be stressful times. There'll be heartaches. But don't go into your Sunday school class and tell them about it. Don't, don't, don't get on the bus route and, and talk about it. Take those burdens to the Lord. Guess what? We as leaders, we've got to, listen, you're a husband or you're a daddy. Guess what? Don't bring all your burdens and dump it on your wife and your kids. Now, that's, that's, hard. that's easy preaching and hard living, too, because sometimes your wife may be the only one you can talk to, but we ought to be taking them to the Lord. Can I tell you, we ought to keep ourselves clean. Somebody needs you. You ever go into a restaurant, and you sit down, and, boy, you're getting ready to eat a nice steak, you know, and you look down, and some woman's hair is right there on your plate. Oh, I know what you do. You just, you know, move it aside and look around, hoping nobody saw it, and you go ahead and dig in, don't you? 
sit down to the glass there getting ready to sip on some old-fashioned sweet tea. I mean, I love sweet tea. And you look across there and you lift the glass to, and, and as you're taking a sip, you see the last lady, she had bright red lipstick and it's on the other corner. Of the, I know what you do. You get a napkin and wipe it off and keep on drinking, don't you? No, you send it back and say, give me, listen, and, and, and listen, some of you would get so upset about that you might leave, and some of you might get so upset that you want your meal free, or you want something, you want a, the next meal free, but yet, spiritually speaking, we do that, don't we? We have a dirty life, and we expect people, well, well, I know I lost my temper, but that's just the way I am. Listen, nobody wants to drink out of your dirty glass, sir. Nobody wants, to, uh, no, nobody wants to hang around and, 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 and uh, take what little bit of good I might give them just cause I'm, and, and put up with my hateful ways. We ought to clean up. Why? Because we need God needs us at our best. Other people need us at our best. And so when you're say, well, I'm going through a stressful time, and, and so, uh, so God gets leftovers. God gets uh, uh, what, whatever time we have left instead of keeping him first in those stressful times. We ought to keep ourselves clean. Number nine, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 through 7 says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He has brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Well, Brother Craig, you don't understand. I'm going through a tough time, and i got to tell everybody about it because that's how I handle it. Jesus went through a whole lot more than you and I ever went through, and the Bible says he opened not his mouth. It would be wise for us to follow our Savior's example and keep our mouth shut when we're going through a stressful time. Why? Because everybody else, listen, the Bible says if one goes in the house and they're discouraged and then the other one's discouraged, then who's going to lift up the other one? Somebody's got to stay on top side. Somebody's got to keep a smile on their face. Somebody's got to keep their head above water. So when you're going through a tough time, guess what? Don't get so high-minded that you don't think it's going to come your way. Uh, realize that when you're going through a tough time and you're in a time of distress and you're dealing with stress, realize that God understands it, but take it to God. He's only a prayer away. Uh, we understand that in order to handle stress and time to distress, we ought to turn to God in our affliction, not away from Him. We ought to find somebody else that's afflicted and use our experience with affliction to help them. It'll help lift your burden. We ought to confess and forsake sin in our life. We ought to stay in God's Word. We ought to keep a right spirit. We ought to keep ourselves clean and be our best for God and for others. We ought to keep our mouth shut and not talk about the negative and not talk about the obvious. Uh, but praise ought to be in our mouth. We ought to thank God that we're not going uh, through anything worse. It could always be worse. Number 10, don't lose hope. Keep your hope in God. Psalms 119, verse number 50 says, This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. He said, I found comfort in my affliction. Why? Because the word of God. My hope is in God. Psalms 119, verse 92, Unless thy law had been my delight, I should then have perished in mine affliction. And by the way, there's some folks I'm thinking of right now that are going through a tough time. And, uh, and, uh, and I wouldn't want to go through what they're going through but they're, they, they're totally laying out of church. Can I tell you, that's not the answer. My hope is in God, and as long as I got God on my side, can I tell you, I've got hope in God, and I, I don't have to lose hope. Don't lose hope. I was dealing with a lady the other day, and boy, she was laying it all on the line, having a tough time, and, and I was trying to figure out if the lady was even saved. And she says, you don't even know me. No, I'm trying to get to know you, and I'm trying to help you. And, uh, but uh, she said, well, I'm through with it. I'm through living the Christian life. And she didn't come last Sunday. Can I tell you, she's lost hope. There's always hope in God. Amen. Don't lose hope when you're going through a stressful time. Why? Because God uh, can get you out of the hole that, that you found yourself in. Last thing is this. Stay or stick with God in his way. Hebrews eleven twenty five, 25, talking about Moses, he says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. See, what you find when sometimes when people are in a, in a moment of distress and they're going through a tough time and, and uh, maybe they even have a tough time listening to, to Bible doctrine because after all, they've never heard it preached exactly like that. They've never seen it exactly like that. And so what they do is, is they don't handle the stress of that. Instead of sticking, sticking by God and, and sticking by God's way, they go find a liberal church and cease to grow and then actually get worse than what they were when they came. Can I tell you, not a, listen, this is a perfect book. 
And regardless of the pastor or the staff or some other layman gets behind the pulpit and preaches, they are imperfect people. So there are imperfect people taking a perfect book, preaching to a, a bunch of other imperfect people, and the standard is always going to be higher than what we are living, and it's always going to be higher than what you're living, but can I tell you this ought to be our focal point? You say, listen, we, we've heard, well, if God says it, uh, uh, that settles it. You're exactly right. Some people say, well, if God says it, I believe it. And that's, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. Listen, God didn't, didn't call us up and say, well, what do you think about that, Brother Craig? He didn't do that. Listen, we get, listen this book is perfect. It'll be our measuring stick. And guess what? When you're going through times of stress, and all of us do, and when we're going and we're stressed out, and we want to throw in the towel, and our flesh wants to take us out of church and take us away from godly living, can I tell you, I just gave you 11 things that you and I ought to do. And can I tell you, that will get you through to the other side. Let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever gone through a stressful time? Raise your hand. All right. All right, those of us that just raised our hand, we've gone through a stressful time. How many stuck it out and you got on the other side and things got better? How many has ever seen other people go through a stressful time and they didn't stick it out and things got worse? Listen, that right there ought to encourage you to stay put. Amen. Because joy does come in the morning. Amen. Look pretty gloomy uh, when Jesus was crucified, but three days later he got up. Amen. And you may go through a stressful time and you may be down and out. Everybody else may think you're down and out, but you may be knocked down, but you're not knocked out. Amen. And can I tell you, Jesus is always standing there ready and willing to pick you up if you'll just stay put. How to handle stress in times of distress. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.